Um, as we see in this passage here, a very interesting text, Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church, and it seems they are taking the Lord's Supper in a way that is unworthy, in a way that does not honor God. In nations all around the world, churches are gathering today, and they take the Lord's Supper. And in the same way that we see in this text, they're not taking it where they're receiving blessing from God, but there are times where it can be taken, and it actually brings the judgment of God on the people. He says they take it in a way that is unworthy. What does it mean to take it in a way that's unworthy? Well, one thing it means, obviously, is they're coming together. The rich people are taking the Lord's Supper. They're bringing their own meal, and the poor aren't getting a chance to eat. Some people are actually getting drunk in the midst of the Lord's Supper. There's division in the church, and God judges them. It means to have unrepentant sin. But not just that. To take it unworthily means to not recognize how special this cup really is, how special the Lord's Supper is. And I think that also happens in churches every day. It becomes simply a ritual. It becomes something we simply do. And we don't realize how special this symbol is for us and what it can do for our spiritual lives. I believe every time we come to take the cup and the supper, God's presence is there. His presence is either there to bless, to give grace, or his presence is there to judge. What does this cup symbolize? What does the supper mean to us? I'm going to give a couple of things very quickly by God's grace. Here's the first one. It's an act of intimacy. When you like someone on this campus that you think is kind of attractive, you say, will you go to 12 baskets with me and we can share a meal And you share a meal. Sharing a meal is an act of intimacy. You get to know the person. You get to enjoy them. In the same way, when we take the cup, we eat before our God. And we enjoy him. And we get to know him more. Eating is an act of intimacy. In fact, we see this a precursor to the Lord's Supper in the Old Testament. If you go to Exodus 24, Exodus 24, I think it's verse 9. We see when the Jews or the Israelites were taking on the old covenant. Guess what they did? Look at uh, Exodus 24, 9. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of Israelites. They saw God, and they ate and drank. So on the day they ratified the covenant in the Old Testament, what did they do? They ate before God. And in some way, God revealed himself to that, to them. In fact, we see this several times in covenants in the Old Testament. Not covenants, but ceremonies. When they gave their tithe, their 10%, they would bring it before God, The priest would have some and eat. Some would be burnt before God, and they would eat before God at the temple. We see this in Deuteronomy 14. In Leviticus 19, they had the fellowship offering. They would come before God, and they would eat their portion of the fellowship. But not only when we see when Christ gives his new covenant, his supper, what do they do? They eat together. One of the things that happens when we come and we take the cup and we take the bread is we have intimacy and we eat before our God. His presence is here this morning. And we eat before him and have intimacy. That's one thing this cup signifies. But what else does it signify? As I said, Christ in Luke 22.20, Luke 22.20 said, In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. When we take this cup and this, this, uh, we, take, we partake of his body this morning, we are saying that we are participating in the new covenant. As you take a bite of the bread, you realize that in the Old Testament, as they ate before God, every year there was a reminder of sin. But in the new covenant, Christ died and wiped away every sin. The lamb that takes away the sin of the world. We bite and we take and we realize 
God has forgiven my sin. But we also realize in the old covenant that they didn't have the power. The power to fulfill the law wasn't given to them. But in the new covenant, God says, I will write my laws on your heart. I will put my spirit in you. As we drink the cup and we bite, we realize that God has given us the power to obey, to love him, to love his word, and to build his kingdom. Lord, I recognize I take part in this cup, and I take part in the benefits of this cup. What else does it signify? It signifies a celebration. A celebration of what? Of his death. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Now, typically, when a great man or woman dies, people mourn. But in this, in this, what they sometimes is called in the Bible, Jude calls it the feast. It's actually a celebration, a celebration of his death. Because in his death, he purified a people for himself. He delivered people from darkness to light. He conquered the enemy. He stepped on the enemy's head. On the enemy's head. So therefore, when we remember his death, it's a feast. Today it's a celebration. It's not a mourning, but it's a celebration of our Savior's death. Many people take this ritualistically because they have lost the symbolism. They have lost the richness of this cup. But we come here this morning, or uh, and, and this morning, when people around the world don't acknowledge God, we acknowledge Him and we celebrate His death because His death has changed our lives. But also, one of the things that we do when we take the cup is we recognize the unity of the body. We recognize our unity. Look what 1 Corinthians 10 17 says. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. We're not taking this supper by ourselves individually, but when we break this body and we all take a piece, we are saying we are one. And we all partake of the benefits of his suffering, his death, and his resurrection together. So we, we, we celebrate our unity in Christ as we break the bread and we take pieces together. One of the problems with the church of Corinth is they broke the bread, but they broke it in division. They were divided. They were separated. So they dishonored the cup. They dishonored the one loaf, not recognizing that God, who at, at Christ, when he died, he made the two one, that Ephesians says. We've become unified, and we're one body. What else does this cup have? This cup has tremendous eschatological purposes. That means the study of last things. One of the things that this cup symbolizes, it is a declaration that one day we too will eat with God in heaven. It is a declaration that one day we will eat, specifically this cup, and this bread with God in heaven. Listen to what Christ said. Matthew 26, 29. Matthew 26, 29. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now, from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Christ said this Lord's Supper will continue. It will continue in the new kingdom. And as we break it today, one day we are looking forward. It's a celebration because one day we'll drink the cup with Christ himself. We'll drink it with him. We'll eat with the saints that have died before us. Hebrews 12 calls it the righteous men made perfect. Moses and Noah and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. We will drink it with him in his coming kingdom. In fact, throughout the scriptures, we see this, these pictures of this, this eating with God. Revelations 19.9 talks about the wedding supper of the Lamb. Matthew 8.11 talks about taking their, their place with the feast of Abraham. One day, this is a prophecy for us. A prophecy that one day 
We will eat and drink this in the coming kingdom. But what else? This also is a, is a picture of his second coming, or one way that we remember his second coming. It says this in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when we, in a, in a little bit, when we take the bread and we take the cup and we take the bite and we drink, we are saying, Lord, come. It's one of the ways, what often happens in our churches is we lose a passion for the second coming of Christ. So one of the things that Christ did was he gave us the supper, he gave us the drink as a way of looking forward, eating and drinking and remembering that he is coming again. In fact, when you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 46, we see that they, they met together, the new church that just, come to, just came together at Pentecost. They met in the temple courts, and they met from home to home breaking bread. This was something that was originally practiced in the home. Maybe small groups, it seems to be an informal gathering, um, but the, probably the father would break it with the children, and they say, we are waiting, son. We are waiting, daughter, because our father is coming again. And they would, they would live a life, these children would go into their schools or go everywhere they're at, realizing that their Savior was coming. I think one of the reasons that we have such a lack of passion for a second coming is because we've lost the symbolism and the richness of this cup. In fact, I believe, I'm not like many pastors that believe only ordained people can give the cup. I really believe that it's something that can be practiced because he gave it to his disciples in the home with fathers who are pastors of their home, breaking it with their children and teaching them to wait. He's coming. He's coming. And this is one of the ways that we stay ready. And I believe when it's broken, as we break it in a second, I think God gives us grace. He gives us grace to be excited, to be excited about one day when we will eat before God, just as we eat before him today. But one day we'll eat, one day we'll eat it in his presence in the kingdom. One day, he is coming back. We celebrate our unity this morning because it's one loaf and we all partake of it. We declare that we participate in the benefits of his death. We participate forgiveness of sins, power to live a holy life. All this is symbolized in the cup. But I also, one of the things I said about taking this cup unworthily, that means that we, we forget the symbolism and the richness of it. But also, one of the ways that we take it unworthily is by not confessing our sins and not being repentant. This means that if Christ died because of my sins, if Christ died because of my sins and, and wiped away my sins and, for, and forgave me, how can I show up and eat when, I'm, when I have animosity toward, towards my parents? How can I show up and I have unforgiveness towards my boss? How can I show up and I dislike my sister because she stinks, she's got a little smell that comes with her. I dislike somebody in the congregation. How can, I, how can I do that, show up this morning, when this all symbolizes that he has done away with that? That would be to take it unworthily. That would be to say, God, you forgave me my sins, you died for my sins, but I show up and eat it in your presence, still holding on to my sins, unconfessed. So as we go and take this cup in a second, one of the things that we must do is take it worthily, recognizing what it signifies, what it's looking forward to, recognizing that he has cleansed me. And as I come this morning, every time we take the cup, it's a time to let it go again. Let go of my unforgiveness. Let go of my bitterness. Let go of whatever struggles I had. Lord, I confess this before you because I remember, I proclaim, I take part in this. I proclaim that you have cleansed me. Right now, I'm going to ask those who are going to help serve the cup with me to come forward. 